Why should we have all the shape-shifting fun? Sometimes animals transform into other things as well. So let's take a look at the Valron. Hello everyone! Valron is a supernatural raven found in Denmark's folklore. One which would either get powers and knowledge from feeding on death kings, or take on a human form after feeding on the blood of a child. Which is completely normal for a poem to talk about, and completely normal for us to reimagine with some spec evil. Big thanks to Alec Foisy for commissioning this episode, and if you find these ravings fun to watch, please hit those like and sub buttons. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Beastmen walk our world. That is hardly a new notion to us. Many diseases have caused humanity to transform into forms that skirt closer to the bestial than to what we are used to recognizing as human. Is it any wonder, then, that other species can also be affected by such phenomena? Today's file takes us to Denmark, the place where such a disease was identified and described in the 16th century. Balfour's disease, so named after the man who did the task, is a viral infection that affects ravens, especially Corvus corax, the common raven. It is usually transmitted after the bird feeds on the corpse of a human carrying a strain of Ravna virus, and the initial stages of infection will cause a deficiency in the absorption of certain nutrients, causing the raven to seek a meat-based diet over fruit and berries. Furthermore, the human DNA markers stolen by this virus will cause the infected raven to favor the same meat from where it got the infection, causing it to crave human flesh and blood above any other prey. This would make any animal dangerous as it is. There is no question about that. But ravens have an edge over most animals in this regard. Being as smart as they are, known to often use tools and take advantage of their environment in the wild, Infected ravens will not wait for human beings to simply die through natural means. They will begin setting traps and staging accidents. Things as simple as pushing objects from above as a human passes, leaving concealed obstacles for them to trip on as they walk, or even attracting predators to their location. Once the human has fallen into the trap, the raven will be free to feed on his body. While in modern times it is easier to avoid these incidents, to a degree, in ancient times they were so prevalent that legends and stories sprung around this behavior, leading to these infected ravens, and even ravens as a whole, to be conflated with creatures such as Valkyries in ancient folklore, which were said to select the chosen slain in the battlefield. As the infected raven continuously fed on human remains, the virus would incorporate more human DNA into their bodies, causing it to change in increasingly disturbing ways. First, most of its plumage would fall off, with an increase in body mass and fat accumulation accounting for the loss of their main thermoregulatory mechanism. As their calorie intake increased, these ravens would become much larger, growing a couple of feet over the course of a year or two. With their increasingly erect posture, a result of their new weight distribution, making them appear even larger. Finally, their own bone structure would change, making their legs stronger and their skull shorter, much more rounded, leading to an increasingly, if superficially, humanoid appearance. These ravens would be called Valron by the Danes who saw them, distinguishing them from their healthy counterparts. Then. Being well capable of observing their prey and figuring out a way to strike, many Valron were known to steal human clothes to disguise their form, making it easier for them to infiltrate human settlements when looking for prey. While the image of a Valron lurking around a human settlement would seem to be a terrifying vision, immediately standing out, the truth is it's not exactly hard for our eyes to deceive us, and for us to ignore such a sight when not looking for it and so it would be easy for the Valron to hide in plain sight, especially in trading centers, where strangers were common. In such places, it wouldn't be hard for the Valron to find distracted humans to prey on, with unattended children being favored due to them being smaller and easier to catch. 
This disease, however, is not as one-sided as it may seem. We did mention at the beginning that ravens get this disease from feeding on human beings, but that makes us far more than mere carriers. When this virus jumps to a human, once the virus is spread to water or soil through the bird species, that individual will act as an intermediate host. As the virus spreads, the intermediate host will present behavioral changes, the most noticeable of which is a reduced activity of the adrenal gland, severely limiting the fight-or-flight response of humans, making them much less likely to avoid danger. Secondly, humans will become attracted to chemical signals present in the feces of ravens, thus bringing them closer to the places inhabited by these birds, an effect similar to what is observed in cases of toxoplasmosis in mice. As a result, when these humans find themselves inevitably kicking it due to an accident or predator, ravens will be close at hand to scavenge off of their infected corpses, thus starting the cycle anew. Although it is possible for Valron to steal genetic material from other species, this is much more rare. After all, animals tend to lack a social structure and infrastructure that would allow a mimic to easily hide among them. And, being more alert of their surroundings, lacking the illusion of safety brought by our settlements, they are more likely to spot any irregularities around them. Yet, while rare, it is still possible. Wolves have at times become part of the Ravnavirus cycle due to their social structure and habits being relatively similar to ours, and the fact that they are well accustomed to the presence of ravens certainly helps, making them more likely to be in proximity of infected feces and corpses. After successfully infiltrating a wolf population and continuing the virus's cycle there, the virus will cause the varron to take on a wolf-like appearance leading to these creatures being, at times, mistaken for werewolf-like creatures as well. And that's it for a speculative biology look into Valron. Don't y'all love when Halloween spills over into November? These lads we found to have surprisingly varied lore for an entity that is limited in scope to a ballad and a story. Even as shown in the beginning and referenced in the video itself, many times being part wolf in many modern interpretations, although this too has precedent in the heraldic Varron, which combines characteristics of a wolf and a raven, despite this being otherwise unrelated to the one from folklore. So, as mentioned other times in the video, we've had so many creatures be a result of transforming human beings that it was only fair we'd let somebody else join in on the fun. But this episode took advantage not only of the physical transformation that would take place, keeping it, if anything, rather subdued compared to other examples, but also from the fact that ravens are extremely smart little things as it is, exactly the kind of animal that would find a way to infiltrate humanity given a good enough motivation. And while not strictly tied to the original lore, I felt tying Valkyries in would be a fun thing, since Odin's shield maidens were known to select those who would die in battle as his two ravens flew over the battlefield, and the Valron looking for people to slay and feeding on the fallen felt like a rather similar concept. So I hope you enjoyed this one, and here's a thank you to everyone who wanted to see this episode. And also thank you to our researchers and research associates who support us through Patreon and YouTube memberships and especially to Alec for commissioning this one and providing the idea we would work on. Remember, you too can join in if you want to support the channel, and you get some nice perks too, like seeing all of our creatures and videos ahead of time and helping mold them into shape. Or you can also like, subscribe or write a comment telling me any type of creature you would like me to give the speculative treatment in the show. Any of those really help the channel a lot. Thank you all for watching and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.